Morning to everybody. Welcome again to our Sunday morning devotion. Uh, a very big thank you to all who have contributed to our Thanksgiving month here at St. Ola's. We've had an awesome response. There's no other word to describe it. And we're very, very grateful to God and to everyone who has contributed. And then uh, Rina von Bader-Lieben, her funeral will now be on Tuesday, the 9th of November. She was the oldest member of our congregation, as I've said, 100 years and 11 months old, and she went to be with the Lord, and her service will be on Tuesday, the 9th of November at 10.30 at, at St. Olaf's. And now this morning, we continue with the book of Daniel as we come to chapter 4, which is about speaking out because God is big. I think it's true to say that in our world today, increasingly so, it's difficult to talk to non-Christian people about the gospel. It might be our neighbors, our colleagues. It might be kings or presidents. It's harder than it was a generation ago, perhaps even, I think, than a few years ago. It's become harder even just to invite someone to church. And the Christian heritage that we've inherited is rapidly uh, draining away. And those that we speak to, we find are often um, apathetic or they're antagonistic towards the gospel message. And so we find ourselves on the defensive and we don't speak quite so freely these days about Jesus and about our faith in him. Now, what's the answer? It's to remember what our part is in evangelism and what God's part is. Think of the most hardened atheist that you may know. Or think of the person who simply, you, you simply can't ever imagine bowing the knee to Jesus. What would it take for them to come uh, to faith? Well, it'll take God's humbling work and it will take somebody's courageous words uh, to speak to them. And that's what we find happening here in Daniel chapter 4, where we see King Nebuchadnezzar, probably the most unlikely candidate in history, coming to believe in the Most High God. So let's see how the story unfolds and we'll refer to some of the verses in Daniel 4 as we go through. Let's begin with the work of God. Nebuchadnezzar himself tells the story of how God worked in his life. It starts out with um, him enjoying the ease and prosperity of his palace in Babylon. That's in verse 4. But then his dreams start up again. Remember, he had them in chapter 2 and now they start, they, they've come back again and they're haunting him. I suppose it's much the same way as how we feel when we suddenly get a call from the doctor's office or a WhatsApp from his office uh, with some information that is not too favorable about the blood tests. But going back to Nebuchadnezzar again, the so-called wise men, the magician, magicians, the enchanterers, they can't tell him what it means. And so Daniel again is the one who has to interpret the dream. And we read this in verse 24 of, of Daniel chapter 4, where Daniel speaks to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, this is the interpretation, your majesty. This is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord, the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals and will eat grass like the oxen and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven times will, pa will pass, seven years will pass, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth. So it's a message of judgment and destruction. And in verse 27, very bravely, very courageously, Daniel tells the king that he needs to take action, that he needs to repent. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then your prosperity will continue. In other words, show humility and repent even though you are the king. And God may be merciful and decide that you will not face this judgment on your pride. Now, initially the king doesn't follow Daniel's advice. So we read on from verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof, of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? And even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been 
taken away from you. You will be driven away from your people and will live like the wild animals and you will eat grass like oxen. And seven times will pass by you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. And immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. So he resisted the window of opportunity that God in his mercy gave him for 12 months. You know, Paul put it like this, God's patience, patient kindness is intended to lead people to repentance. The Bible also tells us that pride comes before a fall, and that was certainly true of Nebuchadnezzar. And so it was that at the height of all of his powers, he heard the dreadful words that his kingdom was no longer his, and he also lost his sanity. Now, the question then is, why is God doing this? Well, it's to bring Nebuchadnezzar to repentance and then to lift him up again. Somebody wrote, when God therefore wishes to lead us to repentance, he is compelled to repeat his blows continually. The blows were painful, but the purpose was glorious, to bring a man to repentance and salvation. That was Alistair Begg. Why would God even bother with a man who is so full of himself like Nebuchadnezzar? It's not because Nebuchadnezzar was a king and a mighty one of his time. It's simply because God is merciful. And so the change came about. And Nebuchadnezzar is wonderfully, as we would say in New Testament language, he's wonderfully converted. And he says so himself in verse 34, that at the end of his time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, my sanity was restored, and then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. God took away. God gave back. But the main point is that the king finally came to realize that God is much bigger than he is. He is greater. He is the ultimate ruler. Next to him, I am nothing. And now he's a witness to the Most High God. And if we go back to the start of the chapter, we see in verse 2, he says, It is my pleasure to tell you. He's talking... Uh, to the citizens in his kingdom to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High has performed for me. And no longer is he boasting and talking about his achievements and his huge building program and the hanging gardens of Babylon and all the victories that he's had in battle. Now he speaks more about God and his ways. And so the question is, well, what does it take? For a man like Nebuchadnezzar, whose heart was so set against God, to actually come to believe and have faith in God. And so we come to point two. And that is about us speaking. And in the case of Daniel, compassion speaks. So we go back to the start of the story where Daniel is called in to give the answer to the king's dream. An amazing thing happens in verse 19. It says, Daniel, also called Belshazzar, Belteshazzar, sorry, was greatly perplexed for a time. His thoughts terrified him. And so the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. And Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your advers adversaries. So what's remarkable here is Daniel's compassion for this murderous autocratic king. I mean, just not too long before, uh, he was trying to do away with his three friends by throwing them into the fiery furnace. And so Daniel, in compassion, speaks truth to power and tells the king the truth of what the dream is saying. And he calls on the king to repent of his pride and to bow to God. And Daniel knew enough about God's judgment that he wouldn't wish it upon anyone. How was he able to do that? Well, it's because Daniel understood God's role in evangelism and he knew his own. And it's important that we understand that. So let's think thirdly a little bit about my job and God's job. Rico Tice is a well-known evangelist in the UK. He wrote a wonderful book on evangelism called Honest Evangelism. At one point he says this, the problem with actually doing evangelism is that it doesn't work. You're never successful. People don't become Christians. The other problem is that you might get it wrong. You're not good enough at it. And if you feel like that, you're right. Your evangelism will never 
make someone come to faith in Christ. And your evangelism will never be good enough to win someone. But here's the thing. It doesn't have to be. That's not your job. When it comes to witnessing the most liberating truth is to realize what our job is and what God's job is. And what is our job? Well, it is to proclaim the gospel. And what is God's job? Well, it is to work by His Spirit through what we have to say. And that's what we see happening, precisely what we see happening in Daniel chapter 4. And, uh, and it's true in our world today as well. Think for a moment about the most hardened uh, person you know, most unlikely candidate for anybody to come to Christ. Nebuchadnezzar would have been top of the list, but maybe you know someone. And maybe if just for a moment I can tell you about somebody I knew in Johannesburg. His name was Mike. And I've called this part Mike and the Bricks. I'm sure I've mentioned him before, but here we go again. He was an engineer. He did extremely well in business. He retired at the age of 56, although he helped his three sons with their businesses after that. His wife Sally came to our church. She was a committed Christian. Mike came along at Easter and Christmas. Um, and he wasn't really terribly interested in what was going on. So to help pass the time, he counted the bricks in this huge wall that we had in the front of the church, much like that big wall that we have there in the front of St. Olaf's. And being an engineer, he quickly worked out a method to count the bricks. And at some point, he told me the exact number. But unbeknown to me, God was working in Mike's heart. And he started to read a book by John Blanchard called Does God Believe in Atheists? Which is a great attempt by Blanchard to address the issue of Christianity and science, which was an area where uh, Mike had a lot of questions, as do many people. Anyway, he couldn't put the book down. He read it right through the night. And he was converted soon after that. And God has used him in subsequent years. Him and Sally moved to Paul. There was a big build, church building project there. And he ran it. He was the project manager. And in many other ways as well. And so we finish off this morning with the question, well, is your God too small? That was a, the name of a book by J.B. Phillips a few years ago. And he challenges us Christians about our ideas of God, how we estimate, underestimate, sorry. We underestimate the greatness and the power of God. We doubt his power. We doubt his control. We doubt his ability to grow his kingdom by bringing people to faith. Um, let's restore our vision of God as he really is. He is the God who is able to humble the king of Babylon and then to raise him up to worship him. And he is the God who in our day is still able to work in the lives of those around us, preparing them to hear the gospel and preparing them to respond, the gospel, to respond to the gospel. And if we remember how big God is and what he can do, then we will pray for those around us and we will start to share the gospel with them. So let's finish now as we pray together. Lord, we think this morning of someone that we know who we believe is most unlikely to ever come to faith in Christ. Help us, Lord, to pray for this person. Help us, Lord, to seek ways to share the gospel with them. And help us, Lord, to understand our role, which is to speak and to share. And Lord God, your role, which is to actually take away the scales on the eyes by the work of your Holy Spirit. So help us to have renewed faith and trust in how big you are, how great you are, and what you can do despite our weakness. And this we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.